Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. We're movie stars. Movie stars? Yeah, um, actors, uh, entertainers. You know, we sing and dance. Hi, and welcome to the podcast. This is Brian Auten, and I'm here with Chad Gross. How are you this week, Chad? Actually, I feel like the floor of a taxi cab. <laughs> uh, woke up a couple days ago with just some kind of like body aches and stuffy head, and I don't know what's going on, man, but uh, I'm here. That is weird. So That is weird. I'm, that is weird. <laughs> they hate this. But um, I am pressing through. And I'm looking forward to today's interview, which is kind of unique among the interviews we've done thus far. Yeah, it's not like a, we're interviewing a famous apologetic author or debater. Today's interview was with a guy named Michael J. Nelson, the former host and writer of the Emmy-nominated Peabody award-winning Mystery Science Theater 3000. So he's uh, done a lot of TV, TV and radio stuff. He co-hosts a podcast with his pastor, David Berge, entitled Like Trees Walking. And that has honest conversations on the topics of faith, apologetics, theology, and current events. So that was kind of my interest in getting Michael J. Nelson on. First off, because I'm kind of like a fanboy in, in a sense of his humor. But also because his approach to the topics and the, his conversational style, I really like enjoy listening to. And uh, I want to find out how he got into apologetics, how it's influenced his life, uh, maybe what it's like to navigate the entertainment and comedy landscape as a Christian. So it'll be interesting. We'll just see how it, that goes. And interesting, I would be interested to sort of recommend his podcast uh, as an apologetics, uh, easy listening podcast, not too like super philosophical or super scientific, but just everyday guys talking about theology and current events and that sort of a thing. So basically, you want to know more about what he does there. Yes. So anyway, Mike, Michael J. Nelson will be joining us. So let's get ready for the interview. Let's get ready. Switch me on. Michael J. Nelson, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I uh, would comment a bit about my fanboy background, but... I would be really making a mistake to try to explain what Mystery Science Theater 3000 is for someone who hasn't seen it, because I'd be telling people that, you know, you're, well, there's these puppets and sketches, and then there's like people sitting in front of a movie screen talking about it. Can you tell our listeners a bit about yourself, the work you do now, and how you made it big by doing these, uh, this Mystery Science Theater stuff? Oh, uh, well, yes, I have yet to make it big. Thank you very much. But um, I feel the same way that you do when you're trying to explain the thing that you liked. This is my lot in life with having to explain the thing that I still do, which is over at rifttracks.com. And we still make fun of movies with some of the guys from Mystery Science. But if you say to someone, and I've been in so many meetings when you go, uh, when I was younger, I would try to get out of it. But I would say like, do you know that show that you would see, you know, it was on in the 90s and it was still on in the 2000s where... You'd see that little silhouette and the people making fun of movies. And if they say yes, you can go, oh, well, hey. That, and then there's all this celebration and fun. If they say no, it's just like, never mind. Well, we'll take a different <laughs> meeting. I'll see you on another day. <laughs> there is literally no way to explain it. But it is just, you know, sitting around with your funny friends making fun of movies is, is about the experience of it. But it's very hard to explain. Yeah. Well, it must be great to say, hey, well, we like watching silly movies and just commenting on them. Uh, well, let's just do this for a job. I mean, how did that even start? I was doing stand-up comedy. Uh, I had just met my wife. In fact, we were married uh, the week uh, before, no, the week after I got a job on this silly show that was just starting, that was just a startup show with uh with friends that i knew from stand-up comedy and um i just thought I, I don't think this is actually a thing but it might be so we left on our honeymoon and i actually in the middle of our honeymoon i called back to the people who are doing the show like is that thing with the puppets and the movies am i still <laughs> still hired there and they were like yeah no we're still doing it it's a real thing um but yeah i just met these people through stand-up comedy and that's kind of how it got started 
Well, I think we'll come back to that a little bit. It's not going to be, uh, you know, puppet show hour or mystery science hour here. Um, but uh, so I came across the reason you're on the this apologetics podcast is, of course, uh, because you've got an apologetics podcast of your own that you co-host with uh, your pastor, David Berge. So I found mm -hmm. out about that uh, maybe a year or two ago and I had a listen. It's called Like Trees Walking which I love that title, and maybe you can explain that uh, reason for that title to our listeners. You know, you've got this background in stand-up comedy, writing humor, doing humorous websites, and being on TV and such. But what made you start an apologetics podcast? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, um, I think it was probably in the, somewhere in the middle of my run in Mystery Science, which pretty much ran till like the year 2000, well, 1999. So for t 10 solid years. And somewhere in the middle of that, I, um, I I was really seeking in my life, and in the end of it, I became a follower of Christ. And I, and so did my wife. Coincidentally, she was kind of she mm. always was. She was she has a strong Catholic background, but she sort of uh, found herself in a similar position to I, and we ended up in a in a way sort of finding Christ in a real way at the same time, which I know mm. is somewhat rare for a couple who was already married. So that, that continued for years. I, I just, you know, I, I remain a follower of Christ, obviously. Uh, but she knew uh, our pastor, Pastor Dave Berge, was, uh, she did youth work, and he was one of the people who sort of showed up at one of her camps or something, and she got to know him and was like, all right, this is a sharp guy. And then we moved out to San Diego for years and came back to where he is in uh, Minneapolis, and he said, Hey, I think I'm going to plant a church. And uh, so we got to know him again. And we obviously, we are now members of his church. And uh, and then uh, we said, we should probably do something together. He's a good, obviously a good communicator. And so uh, we said, let's do a podcast and let's just do sort of basic apologetics because we're both interested in that. He's obviously the, the brains behind the operation. And I'm just the, uh, you know, help him communicate those ideas. Did apologetics play a central role in you coming to Christ, or was that something that you kind of stumbled upon or got interested in after? That's a great question, because you mentioned, maybe this was off air, maybe it's on, I don't remember, that apologetics was central to your coming to Christ. It it was not for me, and then I read a book, and I don't remember who the author is, but it was a guy who was in... Um, uh, the Jesus Seminar. Do you do you guys are you? It's probably maybe a little before your time. The, the mm. Jesus Seminar was this group of of uh, uh, of guys who are like we we doubt the we're going to decide whether the Bible mm. is true or not by you know putting beads into a jar or something. They, right. they had a lot of fame. So like John, like John Dominic Cross and Marcus. Yeah, Board, I think he was those guys. Yep, yep. You're exactly yeah. right. Yep. And so I, you know, being naive, I just picked up one of their books. It's like. Jesus or something I'm like, all right, I got to read more about this guy. So <laughs> I'll read this book. And it was the spectacle, uh, the skeptical version, not the spectacle. That's a different one. Jesus <laughs> and his glasses are unknown to us. Um, but I, uh, and I read it and it was just, it just bummed me out. It was like, man, he, he probably existed, but he probably didn't say this. Uh, anyway, it just took me down a dark path. And so then for a long, long time, I just studied apologetics and, and I just really had this, uh, uh, my wife just noticed it in me, like, what's going on with you? You can't, you, you just don't, you're not filled with that joy anymore. You just don't seem to have that, the joy of life and the Holy Spirit that you had. And I, so apologetics was the way back. And, and really there was a moment that is, is almost magical of, of, uh, finding a book by C.S. Lewis that was just pretty much thrust into my hand by the Holy Spirit that I just went. Uh, and that was like a, a long road to just sort of, you know, studying it and and drinking it in and, and realizing its importance to others who are, you know, trying to find their way to Christ. Wow. Uh, I know for me, there was a time when, um, you know, apologetics kind of uh, rescued me from certain personal faith crises, so to speak. But then later... Uh, and then I kind of I was like, great, that, that was really helpful. And then, you know, I was felt like I was on fire for God and uh, like it was a new fresh start for me. And then 
that brought me to evangelism and trying to share my faith. And then the questions started coming in. And then, then I started approaching apologetics because I, other people had questions, not me. And uh, I wonder what your experience has been along that line is, um, you know, you're becoming a Christian relatively later in life compared to someone, say, you know, being a Christian when they're in their teens or something. So how did that, um, the role, what ro role did apologetics play in maybe your interactions with others or questions other people might have or, you know, personal evangelism, that sort of a thing? That's a great question because I, I think it's, I think it's the thing that everybody asks you. I think it's the uh, modern culture has eroded, obviously, any kind of belief in the Bible. The Bible is not an authority for almost anyone you would just meet on the street. You couldn't just say, um, well, I believe this because, you know, as it says in uh, John 13, you know, like they would go, <laughs> that's not an authority for me. I don't care. Yeah, it's almost like a, a disauthority now. If you were to yeah. quote the Bible, then it'd be like, okay, well, <laughs> we're not listening to you at all. Yeah. Right. So, and I also found it very important with with my children who we, we raised in the faith. They ended up going to a Christian college. But my thought was always, and I don't know who said this, but I, I heard this once when I was when I was a young when my kids were young, is like, if someone asks you, uh, why should I believe the Bible at all? Who wrote the Bible or whatever? Any question, think of the big, you know, the problem of evil. Think of any of those questions. The answer is not, Jesus has a wonderful plan for your life. They're going to say that, I, I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't care. Mm -hmm. And so apologetics sort of is a we we sort of trained our kids in a, in apologetics first like this is the the reason you know there's there's a philosophical basis and then there's as one of my favorites greg kokel says this is the story of the true story of humanity of mankind of the universe right but uh, built into it is apologetics and and of course obviously the bible is the you know is the platform for it all but there's also all these other things that have to be in there, you have to answer those questions for people to even be able to approach them. So that's yeah. what it does for me, I think. So in in seeking your own answers, when you had those struggles after reading the works of kind of the Jesus Seminar and also training your kids, you mentioned C.S. Lewis, but who were who were some of the other uh, influential authors then and even now that that or apologists, philosophers that you find helpful? Um, I think. Uh, uh, Norman Geisler was the one that I I just took uh, a collection of his works. Uh, William Lane Craig was huge in my life when I read his. I think it's called Reasonable Faith, which I think he's updated many times. Uh, and then eventually I, I came across Chesterton, and that's just been I've I've read Chesterton for years and years now. And you know I recommend him to anyone, even non Christians. You you have to read Chesterton. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, just, a, and then, uh, I think he's, he's really been a mentor. I've, I've met him a few times. He's an interesting guy. I think he would never have remembered meeting me, but, uh, we've also done podcasts together and stuff is Greg Kokel, who's so great on the, on the radio and just his, his whole ministry is so great. Uh, stand to reason, um, mm -hmm. has, has been a constant for many, many years. Well, one thing I like about, uh, you know, your podcast and, uh, I think I mentioned it there, the uh, it's like trees walking, is that, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about Greg Kogel and about his manner on the radio. It seems to me that you, you tend to strike me as a, a very approachable, very reasonable, winsome in your tone, humble in your tone. For me, that um, the title of your podcast, Like Trees Walking, I'll let you explain it, but that's why I like the title is what it conveys about more of a humble approach, if you will. Would you talk about that? Yeah, we um, when uh, Pastor Dave and I were looking to do a podcast, I think I just I, I've had many experiences with doing new projects. And the uh, I will just say to the people who haven't created things, one of the most painful things is coming up with a title because the title that everyone likes at first is going to be the title you hate in three weeks because it's too clever and it's too, uh, you know, it's too on the nose or it's too it's trying to do too much work or it's not doing enough work. You know, it's just, it's really tough. And it's also, it's trying to be concise and everything. And I think I just said, look, we just put up a list and you, uh, and then you just live with it for a while. You just roll them around in your head. 
And I put up probably a bunch of bad ones. And then I went to church the next Sunday and he goes, Hey, how about like trees walking? And I went, wait, what? He's like, you know, the, the Jesus puts the mud on the guy, the blind guy's eyes. And he, and he does it once and he goes, look around. He goes, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Uh, Mm -hmm. in other words, I don't see clearly enough yet. And that was, was like, yeah, okay, there you go. That's it. That's it. Because we admit on our podcast, we don't see everything clearly. We invite people to, uh, to come into the conversation. As, as I say, my favorite philosopher is the, uh, the, the this is going to be great for young people, uh, Basil Fawlty from the Fawlty Towers uh, BBC series from 1974 or something. He, uh, he's getting in some predicament and his, his wife says, are you sure that every, is this, is this what's really happening or something? And he says, I don't know, maybe it's a dream. And then he bangs his head on the table and goes, nope, we're stuck with it. And that's my (laughs) philosophy of life. Like, look, we're all in the same position. We're all stuck with this. So we're all trying to figure out how do we deal with this? What is our, what is our answer to being human, you know, being humans on earth in this, you know, predicament that we're all in, we're all stuck with it. So we're doing the best we can. All right. So I can't imagine, you know, it's a walk in the park, maybe to try to navigate being in the entertainment and comedy landscape and to be a Christian. So, you know, you talked about how, you know, you were doing maybe halfway through your mystery science work and then you came to faith, you and your wife together. How did things change after that? Did uh, did you go around telling everybody like, hey, everybody, guess what? <laughs> I'm a Christian right. now. Uh, Re- you know, how did, that, how did that go over, <laughs> you know, with uh, with the peeps? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think it went over pretty well. I I remain friends with everyone. So, uh, many years later. So that's a good, that's a good signal on it. But I think that, um, uh, no, I, I don't think there was a lot of issues with it because we're all from the Midwest, not all from, but all had lived in the Midwest. Some were a few for, were from New York and, for the people that I worked with, I don't think that was an issue. I don't think anything changed all that much for them. And and I don't think we were zealous or pushy in any way. I think that I had, you know, had wise counsel with people to to not do that from we, we had a we also had a Christian counselor, a very important woman in our lives who who led us both to faith, who was <clears throat> was continued to kind of counsel us about it. So nothing Nothing really changed there. But I will say that we weren't in Hollywood and never have been. And I do think that uh, that I think that that prevented us from being ever being cool. I think that God never wanted us to be cool in any way and has prevented us from ever being cool. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that I, I've never been in the heart of Hollywood and had that experience before. So um, that that might be different. I don't know. One of the gigs that you've got right now, which is pretty amazing, is being part of the Riff Tracks website, which is, as I see it, kind of like Netflix meets Mystery Science Theater. So you pick any movie you can think of or some that you could probably never imagine. And then you and your co-hosts like riff on that movie and give commentary. My question is, how can that, does it never get old? I mean, you feel like, you're you're living the same day over and over, like Groundhog Day. Like, oh, what's the movie today? Uh, am I being tortured, or is this kind of like, wow, I can't believe I get paid to paid to do this. This is great. I, I just wonder what's the uh, what's the angle in your mind, or does it go both ways? I think you I think you hit it there. It's a little bit of a mix. I, I think that any any work that you do eventually has an edge of just being work to you. I don't think that's avoidable. I think if you play football, you know, and you love it and you're the best football player in the world, it's still at a certain point is work, but that never robs you of the joy of what you actually do. And I, and I absolutely love what I do in terms of, I think of everything is like, oh man, if I write this perfect joke, there's, and there's been times where I've said, I've thought to myself, like, this is such a great joke. I'm so happy I get to share this with people. And I don't mean that in like... <laughs> in a way like I wrote it. It just means like, it's right. just going to be so fun that this exists and people will see this and and laugh at it. And that's so much fun. But I did say to someone once I was in a, I was in like some seminar or something and I had a chance to sit with people who were fans 
And I said, yeah, you know, a lot of it is just, it's like anything else. It's like in an office and you're slogging through it and you got to get this work done and then you got to move on to the next thing. And so it's not all just, uh, you know, happy times and laughing. And they were so depressed. And I said, what, <laughs> what, is that a revelation to you? Do you think that I'm just a madman sitting there going, ha 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 ha, what fun. Oh, now I get to do this. Ha ha ha. It's like, I'm not, that would be like, like an elf from some movie in Santa's <laughs> workshop, like stop, strap that guy down. He's insane. So right. it's, it's a mixture of both. It's you're doing work, but you're also having fun and you're creating and it's joyous, but it's also, yeah, it's, it's labor at a certain point. Yeah. I'm wondering if maybe when you're doing, I mean, from the Christian perspective, uh, you know, in your views, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of crazy movies. I was on Rift Tracks the other day looking, browsing through and watching the trailers and like having a laugh just watching the trailers. And I'm, But at the same time, I'm thinking, mm, my goodness, what are these crazy shows you've never seen before, like never even heard of, but they're just, they look like the worst budget, worst writing <laughs> ever. It must, uh, it must be like so cringeworthy and uh, taxing on your soul, but my, my, I'm saying that to get to my real question, which is, do you ever come across a movie and you're like, guys, I can't do this one. You know, this this is just, uh, you know, I'm not going to subject myself to this, not because it's just a bad movie out of like poor writing. But this is like, no, this is wrong for me as a Christian. Uh, is that a challenge? Yeah, it is. It is. It, it always comes up. But I think, you know, the, the guys that I work with are long time my companions and friends who I think they trust me. We've, we've had, we've been tested together many times. It's, I'm talking about the sort of core people that I do riff tracks with. I've, I've worked with them for years and years. And, you know, there's, everybody comes obviously from a different point of view. And so you, those things are all negotiable and they have to be. And, and I, I've always, I don't think there's ever been a point where it's like, I'm leaving because of this, or this is too much. Um, but I think that we, we started from a point where we really just want the humor to be, uh, open to everyone and be the most, uh, joyous and, and to just be funny. We're not trying to offend anyone. Obviously things, things change in time and all of this. And, but, um, but that's never been too much of an issue because we kind of all three of us, I'm talking about, uh, uh, Kevin Murphy and Bill Corbin and I kind of have the same point of view about our humor, although it varies and can vary fairly sharply on individual things. Um, but yeah, I've, I've made specific requests to say like, this is just something as a Christian, I'm not comfortable with. Um, and, you know, I've explained my philosophy of it and I have a pretty refined philosophy of how humor works and, and all of that. So I, you know, I do my best not to violate it, but at the same time, um, there is like working with other people, you know, and so there, that that's enters the negotiations. Like, how much are you going to? Um, if I I'm, if I walk away, I, I you know I own a company with with partners. Like all of these people are put out of work, and then nobody gets to see any more riff tracks. So you know that's that's part of the negotiations. I'm not saying there's nothing that would get me to uh, walk away from that. There certainly is. I'm just saying that that's that's all ways into it. If that makes sense. Sure. Well, it seems like uh, you've watched probably every movie ever made. So we were hoping maybe you could just give us profound wisdom about Christian worldview and what you've learned from taking in culture over the years and drop some wisdom. Well, this, I think, disappoints people when I say this, but uh, <laughs> culture is garbage. I mean, that's that that's why, look, I, you know, I came to Christ while I was a person picking over garbage. And now I continue to do that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I would advise anyone to do that. Uh, I, th I, but from what I've learned, and I think this is true. I think this holds true. Whatever culture is doing, do the opposite. And you probably aren't going too wrong <laughs> from a Christian perspective. Yeah, Everything yeah. that culture puts out is garbage and vomit. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Which is a terrible thing to say because then people will go, well, why are you doing it? Well, I, you know, I, I look, don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, that's what I would say. Like, there's not much good out of it. There is some, 
but there's not a lot of good in culture. Hmm. So what is your take on, I know in the, in the almost 20 years that I've been a Christian, one of the things that Christian entertainment has tried to amp up uh, is the quality of their filmmaking. What is your take on kind of Christian movies and, and Christian entertainment and, and where that's at today and the value of it? Well, I think you're right that they've they've tried. They being, as you say, the, the, the vague term, you know, like Christian film and music or whatever. Yeah. I've always thought that it it's terrible that it was like a slum where, OK, here's a here's a halfway decent movie. Here's the Christian version of it. You know, here's the generic crummy, uh, no label off brand version of that. <laughs> yeah. And it's garbage. And th- how does that serve anyone? I, I don't to have a, like a, a, a weird cultural slum to the side of culture. And, and then we have to go over to this terrible trough and drink from the horrible sulfury water, you know, that I, I don't, I don't understand how that helps anyone. And so I, you know, I welcome uh, the movies that have tried to step it up a bit, although I don't know what those would be. I, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I don't, you know, I don't watch a lot because of I spend so much time consuming, unfortunately, garbage that I uh, <laughs> that I don't see a lot of the the good stuff. But I I, I would welcome it, and I yeah. don't, and I don't think that it has to be explicitly Christian. I've often thought about that. I, I think that you know, I you know, one of my favorite books of all time is C.S. Lewis's Till We Have Faces, which has almost no explicit Christian message in it. It's just a an incredible tale with, you know, just like wisdom and everything in it. So I, I don't know that that has to be explicit. Yeah. All right. Well, one of the things, uh, Mike, on your podcast is that you do, you have a fun little game towards the end. So we've got a fun little game for you. Well, I'm calling it a game. I'm just naming it seven questions for Mike Nelson. <laughs> okay. So you can just answer them as fast or slow as you want, but it's really sure. just. Usually a, it's my, it's Pastor Dave who's on the line, but now it's me. Oh, turn yeah, about, well, turn about. This is just another way for me to ask random questions and get away with it. Um, sure. All right. So worst movie of all time. You probably have heard oh. this question a lot. I'm so I'm expecting you to a quick answer. Uh, wow. Well, I will just preface it by saying it is Usually the thing that I most recently saw, <laughs> um, uh, but we just saw a movie called Alien Dead, which <laughs> is just like, it's kind of like people from the South acting like uh, hee-haw crackers. <laughs> and, and I'm using, sorry, I'm using their term for it. Oh my uh, God. getting eaten by aliens who live in a swamp. That was like a trailer home blew up. And <laughs> anyway, it's, it was so bad and incoherent and it angered me. So that's you know, nice. That, so alien dead. Yeah. All right. Put it on your uh, Netflix queue there. <laughs> right. So, uh, okay. Number two, what's the most overrated movie franchise of all time? Uh, I oh, I can, I can choose from so many, but I, <laughs> I, I will. I will have to say Star Wars. Yes. I <laughs> yes. I don't. I. I've. Well, I've made much of it on a few of my podcasts. I do not. I'm not saying it's. It's absolutely terrible. It's just something I do not connect with at all. I don't get it. I don't. And I should be in the wheelhouse. Like I'm of the age where I should have had all the toys and everything. I did <laughs> see it in the theater. I remember it. And I was just like, eh, eh not for me. I'm of the opinion that the, when I grew up with the original three, they were fun. And then everything they've done since then has been garbage. I'm glad to hear the word garbage connected with it. Thank uh, you. Yes. Yes. Well, I tend to be like uh, all the all the comic books that have been made into Marvel. You, every, if you can call it a, like a comic book universe, I'm like, nope, I'll take a pass on that. Well, I agree with you on that. Um, but I, that's another one where I just like, I do not understand it at all. <laughs> I don't get it. But, uh, I especially don't understand why, uh, when I was growing up, uh, movies were tried to be around 90 minutes, right? Yeah. What is this? What is this trend of inflicting me with two and a half hours of like Transformers or a Marvel movie? Like what? <laughs> Transformers. Or sometimes <laughs> three. The, sometimes three yes. hours. Yeah, I know. The, the the quote from the great, the late great uh, Irving Thalberg was a famous uh, movie uh, mogul back in the day. He died very young, but he was known to be a genius. And somebody was 
putting on his was screening his two and a half hour movie, and he said, and I'll say the I'll say the uh, uh, the correct language here. Uh, I'll censor it a little bit. He said, "My butt only has ninety minutes." He screamed at the director, <laughs> <laughs> meaning just cut it. And he's like, "But it's this is I, to tell the story." He's like, "Nope." Nope. <laughs> yeah. You got to keep it to this length. And that's my, that's my view of it too. My patience. I, I, I don't have three hours to watch a Marvel movie. Yeah. Mm. All right. Number three, what's your favorite argument for the existence of God? Oh, my favorite one. Uh, what I do, sometimes I'll, I'll hear something. I will, I'll hear an argument against God, or I'll hear something that sort of gives me that little chill of like, oh, oh, am I wrong? Uh, and then I just go back to the beginning and think, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Something exists and morality exists. Like uh, there is, uh, my own thoughts exist, morality exists, and then there's the revelation of God. Those things together make me go, oh, okay, wait, well, calm down, man. <laughs> We're okay. <laughs> because uh, without, uh, with no morality, if there's no morality, but there is morality, that's the thing that just like you can't get rid of it. It's very troublesome to because I, I was an atheist. I was a very poor atheist, by the way. I never had any good <laughs> arguments. But uh, and I was like a strict materialist, which is probably the worst. You know, that's a terrible place to be. You have nothing to stand on there. But that would be my best one is just like uh, you ought to be kind or good or nice is a statement everybody makes. So that's the one we're stuck with. You can't get rid of it. That implies someone above us. That implies God. And then you can start from there. Good, good. I like it. Okay. Uh, your worst stand-up comedy bomb ever. <laughs> oh, that's easy. <laughs> um, this has happened a, a couple of times. But I was doing stand-up once in uh, a far-flung suburb of uh, Minneapolis, probably in the late 80s. And uh, I just the the comedy club owner sort of liked me, but he wanted to bring me down a couple notches. So he put me in between two two people who would you know be killing would he knew would do really well. And that's always a bad place to be. You want to you know you want to kind of warm up and people get to know you. Uh, so he put me in a spot that would just devastate me, and it did. And I just utterly bombed. And as I was walking down the, the row of people to leave to the back of the theater, this guy pulled on my sleeve and I'm like, oh, a fan, I see. <laughs> he's like, no. And so I bend down because the other comedian's still talking. And I'm like, huh, what? Because he's saying something to me. And he goes like, I'm going to meet you out back and I'm going to kill you. I'm going to put a knife in your guts. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wait, what? It's like, I hated everything that you said. <laughs> wow. I went, what? Uh, seriously? He says, I'm serious. I'm going to meet you out back. I'm like, well, I'm not going to be there, but okay. <laughs> Thanks. It's kind of ironic how seriously he takes comedy. Uh, yeah. But yeah. He, was, yeah, he was dead, dead yeah. serious. So did uh, you ever, did you ever bomb on purpose? I did. I did. It's not yeah. a, it's not a good thing to do. Um, they call it, there's kind of a, a, a term of art is like making the band laugh. When you know your your audience isn't digging you, and so but you have friends or the band is you know in the back or whatever, and the, or people in the green room, and you hear them laughing, so you play to them. Uh, it's never a good thing to do, um, but the temptation is there because you're just like, who cares? These idiots don't appreciate my genius, so I'm just going to torture them. Uh, it's not a thing I've done for many many years. It's a very <laughs> immature thing. Yeah, I remember, I remember, I don't know if I read it or if I heard it or something, but how uh, Jim Carrey, when he was doing stand-up comedy, he uh, he was, I guess, an impressionist initially, and uh, he had this fear of, you know, failing and things. So when he started doing regular comedy, he would purposely bomb just so he could get over the fear of bombing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just... Oh, there are some people who liked it. I, I heard that... Um uh who was the snl actor who used to like to bomb and then he would extend the sketches oh i can't remember who his name was but also um i remember there was a in in the old days of the letterman show letterman had a sketch that was just utterly bombing and and the writer who wrote it was on stage playing like you know bob the librarian or something and then uh the guy goes oh, well i'll see you later then dave letterman he goes oh no 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 
you're staying here for the whole sketch. <laughs> so he made the writer stay out there while the sketch just utterly bombed, just like standing to the side, like looking sad. <laughs> it was very funny. <laughs> so uh, we asked you about your favorite argument for the existence of God, but uh, here's one for you. If you're trapped in an elevator with Richard Dawkins for 30 minutes before you both fall to your death, what do you say to him? Yeah, I don't I don't know his. I, I A friend of mine read one of his books and said it was the worst argument against God he'd ever read. Uh, Probably the God another, delusion. This is another Christian apologist. So uh, I might just do that with him and just say, you know, my friend read your book and he said it was the worst <laughs> argument against him. What do you say to that, Mr. Charming British man? Uh, because I've, I just think that's funny. I've had that when uh, one time a person said to me, um, uh, Mike, I... Uh, and, and I, I know this, this is a very, a, a thing that happens a lot. If you have even a tiny modicum of fame or you produce anything, people walk up to you and go, hey, I, uh, I saw your show the other night. And then total silence. And in and, and the early days of hearing that, I would say, oh, yeah, what'd you think? And they'd go like, yeah, you know, <laughs> and so, so I've learned what I do is go um, utter, utterly blank silence on them. Like, yeah, I saw your show or I read your book. And then I just leave it sitting. I just leave the most uncomfortable air hanging there. And then they, they look at me expectantly, like waiting for me to say, like, what did you think? And I will not do it. And so, so they walk away sort of defeated, like, yeah. So anyway, all right, take it easy, man. <laughs> so uh, I would like to just insult another author by saying that uh, my friend read your book and it wasn't your best effort would be my thing that I would do to him. Moving on to number six. Do you like movies about gladiators? <laughs> I I do quite enjoy the movie Gladiator, as you as you would, uh, <laughs> as long as you're mentioning it. Um, uh, other gladiator movies? Uh, <laughs> trying to think. Uh, but speaking of that line, which is, that's from Airplane, right? Indeed. Yeah. Okay. So we had friends over who were younger, and they, <laughs> we were watching... Um, uh, what's the 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 spy one? The one with uh, made by the same guy, Naked Gun. No, the the the, the earlier one with uh, Val Kilmer. Uh, what's the name of it? Uh, oh, Top Saint? Secret. Classic. Top Secret. Oh, I don't know that. Okay, so Top Secret is my wife. I I just put Top Secret on because we're all just sitting there waiting, like it's raining or something. We're gonna go play tennis, and these young people have no idea. And like here's a. Uh, Here's Top Secret. My wife goes, why are you putting on Top Secret? You know, which is from like 1983 or something. And uh, these young people start watching and it's, you know, just bad joke after bad joke. All of them sort of physical jokes or just clumsy puns. And they're like, ha, this is great. <laughs> uh, it's like, oh, wow. So I can just do this in my comedy? I don't have to work that hard? Okay. <laughs> I think number seven here you've already answered, but uh, what persuades you most that Christianity is true? Maybe not the argument for the existence of God, but uh, about Christianity being true. Yeah, I guess that is a distinction. I think that I just can't get over the fact that there, there's no other religion, I think, unless someone can come up with one where a historical event is at the center of it and an attested historical event that has at its center both the miracle and, um, you know, the redemption of the universe. It's pretty particular in this thing. It's like if you were at, uh, you know, the place of the skull on that day, uh, I believe that if I could be transported in a time machine, I fully 100% believe that I would see Christ on the cross and I would see the two robbers and I would see, I would see the piercing of his side and I would see the blood dripping down. I would know like this happened. And then I would see him, uh, I would see the empty tomb if I were transported, you know, a couple days later. This, this is, makes it unique among religions, like central to it is this thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that was, you know, from the earliest days, it wasn't like it was developed later. It was like, this was a hymn to the early Christians. Like, this is what we know. This is what we saw. Uh, Christ died. He is risen. I, I think that is so, I, I don't know how you get over that one. It is, it is real. It is unique and it is central to it. And then it's obviously connect. It's not like 
it just came out of, you know, like a flying saucer. It's like it actually connects to the fact that this was God's plan from the beginning. And that's that's a tough one to escape from, I think, for for any thinking person to say, oh, wow, those things seem to connect. So maybe they do connect. Yeah. Well, I like that uh, quite a bit. That's the end of our seven questions with Mike Nelson. But uh, I wonder just, Mike, uh, when you're sharing your faith, would you would that sort of be your go to as well? I mean, if you're explaining it to someone else and I mean, because to me, I, I love like what you're saying there. To me, that's a very winsome, um, commonsensical approach. Just thinking if you're teaching a Sunday school class, would that be pretty spot on as far as the, your approach? Uh, it probably would. Uh, you know, I guess it has to vary with with people. We we have in our lives a lot of people who aren't Christians, and I I, I remember years ago I heard someone saying that the the most effective uh, evangelists they ever heard were were these people who were just very 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 kind and welcoming to people, and just were friendly to people and would ask questions for years and years, like the long con. Uh, so I agree with what you're saying. If I was teaching a class, I would probably go with that. But in life, mm-hmm. I, I guess I'm more of the long con where it's like, you know, I'm always prepared to give an answer for the hope that I have within me. Yet, at the same time, there are people who are just so far away and angry that I just think that like friendship and, you know, walking alongside people is also, you know, one of the most effective things. Mm-hmm. Um because eventually they're going to say, hey, why are you still my friend when I'm <laughs> a miserable, miserable person? Or, you know, not always miserable, but just like no hope or no meaning or going through all these trials and everything. So, um, so yeah, I diverted your question, but you know what I'm saying? But I, I yeah. think that that would be my, it would be my main thing is that, that no other religion is historical in the way that Christianity is, and it's not attested to. And you can, obviously you can look that up. And I, I, I'm annoyed by the the uh, the erosion uh, of the uh, the accuracy of the Bible, you know, done by those like, oh no, do you know there are 20 million mistakes in the Bible? Like, oh come on, that's because right. there are 20 million copies of the Bible, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's my long answer. Well, we're going to start to wrap up, but uh, you know, Chad and I have a we we tend to use the Ghostbusters quotes on uh, the podcast because. It's one of those movies where we have in common where we just can talk in Ghostbusters quotes. Um, mm-hmm. So we kind of have this idea that it's, um, you know, the most quotable movie of all time. I tend to, you know, think that plus maybe the three amigos is there with it. But the question is, and and Chad disputes me even asking. Yeah, because, I mean, it's objectively true that Ghostbusters is the most quotable movie. I don't understand why there's even a debate <laughs> here, but that's OK. We just need a external validation source to say, is this the most quotable? Is there something more quotable, uh, the most quotable movie of all time? What's your opinion? I think that any movie that people share and find the quotes in is quotable. I have to say Ghostbusters, for whatever reason, isn't in my quotables. N- not because I don't, not because I dislike it or anything. I just don't have friends that had shared it together, but I, in, I, entirely uh agree that uh you know using quotes you know to communicate with one another with friends especially is is one of the greatest things i think uh my sons and i my wife will look over at us and we're just talking in code and she'll go what are they doing now you know like we're right we're we're just quoting this or this and this and then now it's onto this and but yeah that's a fun way and and we we have friends currently who i mentioned it already we introduced them to uh, Faulty Towers, the the uh, uh, Basil Faulty, the uh, proprietor of a terrible hotel. It's a it's a sitcom from the '60s, but they loved it, and they now just can't get enough of it. And so there's a lot of quotable lines from it. So <laughs> I'm into quotes, but give me your quotes from what What are the quotes that you communicate with in oh, Ghostbusters? Man. Oh man. Do we have time for this? No, I'm just kidding. I'm throwing it back on you. What is no, your No, that's favorite? fine. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, uh, this is big, Peter. This is very big. Uh, this reminds me of the time you tried to drill a hole through your head. That would have worked if you wouldn't have stopped me. You're right. No human being would stack would books, stack like, books this. like this. <laughs> this ever happened to you? No. You? No. Somebody blows their nose and you want to keep it? Egon. 
your mucus. Yeah, it could, could go on. Chad, could, do you think you could start at the beginning of the movie? And because if you could do that, I would stay here for that whole thing. And then, yeah, I mean, it, no one would listen to it, but I would. I, right. I, would listen to it. I, I, I think would between I think between the two of us, we probably could. You could muscle it out. Yeah, I think like, we could. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. boy. Yeah, for the, for all the Patreon premium subscribers, then that's what they have in store. They can listen to us read the Ghostbusters script. Oh, I promised that I would do. I did this earlier, and I might have messed it up. But my, you were asking about my sound rig. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yes. All right. So I'm going to reveal what I have. I wish I had the camera. You know, it's not a camera thing, but I can talk about it. Uh, so I have my microphone. Uh, sitting on a, uh, let me see, I'm going to lift it up. You can kind of hear it. This will give it verisimilitude to the, uh, to the bit here. Uh, is above a, uh, it's sitting on my desk on top of a uh, PB Fit uh, powdered peanut butter can because <laughs> it's plastic. So it absorbs oh, yeah. the, so here, if I tap the side, you can barely hear that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So this is a, a quite a rig here. Uh, but once I was. <laughs> I was doing a podcast and I had a jar of change in a quart jar that was nice and weighty. So I put that above the, uh, the, I put the microphone on the jar of change. And during the podcast, I snagged the, the cord and it pulled the jar off and it hit this bar on my desk and it shattered the jar. And so, you know, like <laughs> 8 billion pennies went all over, mixed with glass all over my office during the middle of my podcast. So I couldn't move or go anywhere or step or so. <laughs> so I'm really, guys, it's a pro rig is what I'm saying. I'm really it sounds up. like it. It really yeah. Yeah. sounds pretty advanced. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, they it, probably have that on the alien dead. That's us. Uh, yeah. Studio quality here, guys. Yes. Studio quality. Yes. Well, pro tips with Mike Nelson. Uh, Mike, before we uh, wrap up, please Tell our listeners where they can find all your good stuff at Riff Tracks, what they can expect if they want to not Google and they just want the, the pure, unadulterated link. Yeah, I urge them not to Google. Don't use Google. Uh, uh, Google said, don't be evil. And then they went and they got evil pretty quickly. You can go to uh, RiffTracks.com. You can go to uh, uh, LikeTreesWalkingPod.com. That's uh, the... Uh, uh, my uh, podcast with uh, Pastor Dave Berge, that is Basic Apologetics. And then I have another, I have a bad book podcast called 372 Pages We'll Never Get Back. That'll, oh. make, sense. That'll make sense if you go to that, because that, that started uh, when we uh, we were making fun of uh, Ernest Klein's Ready Player One, and uh, we thought that would be the end of it, but we've kept going since then. So, so it's like so uh, Rift Tracks for that. Books, in, in other words. It is Rift Tracks for Books with uh, one of my fellow writers. We're currently working on, by the way, D uh, Tyra Banks, you know, the, the model, the yeah. supermodel. She wrote a book called Model Land, which I oh. think she was trying to imitate harry potter for models or something oh man. but it is what? bananas it is out of this world insane and it goes on for like 500 pages it's the most insane book i've i've ever read <laughs> wow and she claims she worked on it for three years i wow. I, I i mean reading and i have no doubt but uh it, it is nuts so I'm, we're currently doing that is it That's... popular oh it was uh well weirdly it's out of print right now which is because it was only written not that long ago right and for a book to be out of print is like wait they just print them on demand so so to say it's out of print is almost to say like uh, look let's pretend that that never happened let's just <laughs> that is you know, weird right he wove in a ghostbusters quote right there and you, right under the radar <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you today, Mike. Uh, Indeed. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll point everybody to your stuff in the show notes. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. It's been uh, a great hour talking to you guys. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. 
And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast, and we also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice, and please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetic stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. Reclaim your summertime in Grapevine and rediscover an exciting summer full of fun. Play hard, chill out, have fun, and get away. It's summertime in Grapevine. Bring the whole family and make some memories. Now through Labor Day, shop on Main Street and Grapevine Mills. Dine at our new Harvest Hall. Check out our new Grapevine Main Station, Sea Life Aquarium, Lego Land Discovery Center, museums, wineries, galleries, fireworks, and more. Reclaim your summer at summertimeandgrapevine.com. As Red Robin's voiceover artist, I'm here to explain bottomless. How do I get across free refills on fries and drinks? Well, here goes. Bottomless at Red Robin means free unlimited refills on the fries and sides that come with every burger or entree. That means free refills on steak fries, sweet potato fries, Yukon kettle chips, garlic fries, broccoli, side salad, soft drinks, iced teas, freckled lemonades, and even root beer floats. Offer doesn't expire until your appetite does. Whew, nailed it. Red Robin. Yum.